Greetings! Okay, I need to set a little expectation for this upcoming video. It was recorded about a year ago, towards the end of my period of disasters with hardware, either caused by physical failure, which I didn't notice at the time I was recording, because I'm a one-man band, or at least I was at the time, and B, because I didn't know how the new hardware I was buying worked. And you're going to see this now with the GoPro, uh, which has this bizarre self-leveling feature which stops at 45 degrees and isn't visible in the preview screen. I now know. So what have we knowing in the years since? I've been investing in a bit more hardware and it got to the point that I hired somebody to come along with me for the week in Belgium who knew what he was doing with the camera and was able to do real-time monitoring. So hopefully what you're going to get from this point on is a far greater quality of output. In the meantime, well, there have been recording sessions that I've simply had to bin what I recorded. And JLTV is a case in point, believe it or not, I actually did record it. Although they wouldn't even let me record the cup holder that's in the vehicle. Although they're very proud of the cup holder. But anyway, this video, I think I've been able to fix good enough to get released. Very close. Uh, but I've dealt with the wind noise, I think. And, well, okay, you're going to have to live with strange angles on the camera. But I've wrote, you know, it's the result of rotating the image to be the correct way around. But I've kept with it anyway for a couple of reasons. A, well, this is part three, and I promise you a part three of Corsair. B, the guys at the Austrian War Museum were extremely helpful. They pulled out all the stops to help me make the video, and it's not their fault if I did a little bit of messing up. So their efforts and their vehicles still deserve to be shown. So with that caveat in mind, I hope you enjoy the video. Greetings all! Yes, we are still in Vienna. Well, actually now we've moved a little bit outside of Vienna uh, because that's where this thing is and one or two other yokies. So you will notice that this Curacier also is not quite like the other. They've made it just a little bit bigger. And to show just how much bigger they've made it, we've arranged a little side-by-side -side demonstration. So I'll just get out of the way whilst our friends here in some secret location, I don't know, actually know where we are, but we're a little bit outside of Vienna. Uh, actually, I wonder if I can pull up, my GP, pull up my GPS and warning signs will go off going, ah, GPS tracking system, tracking system. But uh, they're bringing around an old fashioned cursor to get a side by side comparison as to just what they've done with this one. Okay, so. On my right, I have a Curacier A2 variant. This is basically the last production service variant of the Curacier. So you have the same M57 French 105mm uh, uh, gun. You have upgraded to a digital fire control system, applies the super elevation, all the good things. Uh, there's a thermal imager. The automatic transmission even. But, and here's the but, it's the same M57 gun. So there was some thinking. Could we put a bigger gun on it? And the request was actually started by Argentina, who wanted a bigger gun. And well, they were already using the 105 on the TAM, the tank Argentino Mediano. And the thinking was, well, can we shove this into the current here? And the Austrians were also thinking, you know, we're, we're looking around with two different types of ammunition here. We got the M60 with the M68 cannon, the 105, basically the, the British L7. And we have the Cursier with a different type of 105. It will make life so much simpler for everybody if we could use the same ammunition on the two different vehicles. Oh, and by the way, it also gives you more punch. Fantastic. So off they go to the development agencies and they say, can you make us a 105 type gun? So give us a 105 type gun then, please, because we don't have any. So they went to... Uh, for whatever reason, they, they couldn't get a, an L7 off the Germans, and they couldn't get an M68 off the Americans. So they went to Argentina to bought an M L7 off the Germans, and then gave it back to the Austrians to install onto this development vehicle. So what we're looking at here, I mean, it doesn't really look up, but this is basically an L7 gun, slightly different bore evacuator, and of course you've got a muzzle brake at the front, which leads us to the problem with the vehicle we'll get into in a little bit. So of course in order to get everything to fit, well, they had to make a bigger turret. Well, experience making a bigger turret, we just looked at one. This one's even bigger. Uh, as inside it's like the same fire control system as we saw on the Super Curves here, uh, except now we have a thermal imager 
uh, with repeaters, so both TC and the gunner can have a look at it. And well, you, you got to somehow get a large 105, or large for the time, to fit onto a small tank. And well, this is their attempt at doing it. So let's have a quick look around. And uh, this isn't going to take us too long, actually, because there isn't much to it. Uh, we'll see what the final step could have been for the Cursier. Okay, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the hull because it is a Cursier. Uh, if you look at the back, you'll see it has an older taillight style, round taillights, instead of the more modern Leopard type on the Super Cursier we saw earlier. Uh, the difference, of course, being underneath, it looks like there's only room for about 15 rounds. I can't wait to get and have a quick look inside. Otherwise, same layout of taillights, wing mirrors, whatever, all, all good stuff. The turret is where things get different. Now, the bottom half of the turret is very similar to that of his typical Cursier, although it has been pointed out to me that I probably hope I would have noticed eventually this is welded as opposed to a cast on a typical Cursier. The top half, though, is much bigger. And again, I mean, we're talking a light tank, there's only so much armor you can put on it. But you'll see the depth of the bustle on the 105. L7 versus the depth of the bustle on the M57 tank. And the reason, of course, is that those rounds I showed you earlier are much, much larger in terms of diameter than they are on the medium pressure French gun. So it takes you a lot more room inside. Now, this makes the back half a lot heavier, but the plus side is that you're sticking a much heavier gun on the front half. So hopefully it'll balance out until you shoot off all of your big 105 millimeter ammunition and then you're very unbalanced again. So that might be one of the problems with this vehicle, why it didn't enter service. There is another problem, and well, that is frankly, the gun was too powerful for the vehicle. So the turret ring is only yay big. And you also, because of the auto-loading system, have to have a certain amount of room to get the, uh, the gun to recoil. Now, there are two ways of reducing recoil on the gun. One is you put a big muzzle brake on the end. Well, they've done that. Another is you try to give it a longer recoil stroke to give the system more time to absorb the energy of the round being fired. Well, you don't have the room in this vehicle. So the end result was that they couldn't absorb the recoil. And uh, according to Franz, who of course is again just off camera next to me, you could fire the gun between 10 o'clock and two o'clock and that was the end of the story. Now, again, it can be fixed if you have enough room, like the external gun on the Striker MGS. You could fire it to the side of an MGS with that problem, but you had a lot more room to play with the recoil. But again, you have the, the big square welded turret with the large gunner's sight housing up top, much larger actually than you find on the other Cursiers. Back of the turret, again, compared to the Cursier, you're looking at two small loading doors because the rounds are just so big, you can't load them up and straight down anymore. Well, you probably could, but you'll, you'll end up getting back problems. And the ejection port remains there. It's a little bit lower, it looks like, in comparison to the, uh, the standard Cursier. But again, you can see just how big and blocky this particular turret is, and the little ventilated housing up at the top. You do have the same domed commander's cupola up in the top as well as you had on the original. Now the cupola on this vehicle, as you can see, it's a little bit uh, more rugged than that on the original vehicle. We have a lip on the front and a larger sight for the commander's vision system, uh, which I'm told could well have been the thermal imager on that side, simply because there was no other place to stick the thing, as opposed to they mounted it externally on the A2 Cursier. But you'll see the slight different shape of the TC's cupola on that particular vehicle. So if you want to look forward, the commander basically needs to use one of the sights because the sight housing is completely blocking his view otherwise. He does have the array of periscopes you can see around me, no problems. To the left, I do believe this ab foyer ring left and right is for the smoke grenade launchers. The same fire control uh, panel with the ammunition selector main gun uh, that we saw on the earlier version of 
the super curse here. Now, the, the fun bit is towards the back. And believe it or not, they've compartmentalized the ignition. So as I stick the camera towards the rear, and hopefully this will work, you can see that the compartment for the right side ammunition revolver has a steel door in the way. So on the earlier 105, it was basically open to all. But no, it's, it's actually boxed away. And if you compare that with what's on the right-hand side, that door is open. And you can see it's, it seems to slide downwards out of the way. And uh, the round will then roll into the central loading tray and then get rammed forward. Of course, the loading tray is a little bit bigger because of the size of the round. The rammer, you can see, is that uh, Yoki projecting down from the top. Yoki is a technical term. And I'm told that when the carousels were installed, they were indeed still six round magazines. So, of course, you do want to be able to access the ammunition in case of power failure, and I think there's a way of doing it. So, there's this little lever up here. It says turn to lock. I think that's for the ammunition compartment door, the little round loading hatch on the far side. And then, if I look way down, there's a red handle. Red probably meaning emergency. So if I pull this red handle, I have a feeling that releases the hydraulics to the door and the door just slams down and you can access the next round ammunition that way. The gun to my right is, as I say, a German-built L7, although I am told, and I have no idea where they are, that there are markings on here indicating that it came via Argentina. Uh, Argentine army markings. Can't see them, uh, but they're in somewhere. It is, as you can see, a vertically sliding breech block that they put in this one, uh, which makes a lot of sense because sideways, it's, it's a large breech block to get in the way of uh, your shoulder of one of the two crewmen on each side of the gun. Control handles are the same as found on the earlier version, again, without the rocker for the laser rangefinder. System is entirely electric. There's an air raid siren going off. Maybe they figured out that there's a foreigner with a camera on this base. Oh well. Let's hide, hide in this experimental vehicle. Last place it ever checked for me. Oh, good God. Okay, gunner's side. Um, I'm hoping that this seat is in the fully depressed position because it's low even for me. Unfortunately, it's so dang tight that I can't turn around to see. Uh, and um, you can't do anything in here. I mean, I am. Hey, let me try to show you here. So my this is as far to the right as I can go. And uh, without moving my body yet, I should now move as far to the left as I can go. That's it. Um, okay, I can stretch my hand way out here. And you can see this kind of long, thin compartment that I'm in with no room to move one side or the other. I mean, the saving grace, I guess, is at least the gun is, isn't elevating and depressing uh, because, of course, I'm going up and down with the gun. Uh, but otherwise, oh dear God, okay. I mean, literally, I, I to get my arm around, I kind of have to reach backwards. I, 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 I can hardly get my arm around uh, behind me. This is, this is this tight. Actually, I wonder if I can sit up here. Does this give you any sort of idea as to how cozy and tight this thing is? Uh, because, yeah, it's not pleasant. The camera is now resting on the backrest, and you can see the controls here for the primary sight. Uh, to include a laser rangefinder, you see those range gates. It's a selectable range gate, interestingly enough. You can go from 150 meters to 5,000 meters. And what a range gate does, what a range gate does is it uh, puts a minimum range on your lays. So if there's obstacles in the way, uh, you can ignore the minimum lays that you get back. That said, I don't think I've ever seen a selectable one like that. Usually it's just defaults, but they put a 150 to 5,000 meter range gate. 
Another control they have up here is the magnifier, so by three or by 10, by just pushing the button there. Now the original Curacier and indeed the Super Curacier had a fixed by eight only, so there's an improvement there. Uh, manufactured by SFIM, I, I, I duly note. There is the same anti-point on the left for the coaxial machine gun. So again, the spent case would fall down the sides into a collection bin and ammunition would feed up uh, out from underneath. I also, as you can see, have no particular access, unlike the earlier Curious series, uh, over my left shoulder, there's no access to anything. I can't even see the loading trays. There is one more item up here, and that's this motor over my left shoulder with a handle. And I'm wondering, because the Travis handle on the right has been moved a little bit out of my way, but the elevation handle remains on the left, I'm wondering if this is the hand crank for the loading system. Uh, because again, unlike the uh, the earlier Curacier, where you, if you had to ram something in manual, you could ram something in manual, just reach back and, and shove. Uh, you you don't have, you can't do it with this large round. So I have a suspicion this is related to ramming. Well, there you go. This is about everything I can tell you about the Super Curaciers. Again, a shout out, thank you to the Harris Gesichtliches Museum. German was never my strong point. Look at the Jagdpanzer IV video. And to Mr. Franz Bordel for showing me around. And also, of course, a thank you to the Patreons for funding not only the trip out here, but also some of the new gadgets and gizmos, such as the GoPro, which is my first outing for this new GoPro. Actually, it's also my first real outing for the new microphone that I've got on top of the camera, which is my backup uh, for when things go wrong elsewhere. Hopefully, uh, we'll see how things work out. The problem with this is once you do the videoing, you don't know how the audio is going to work out until you're done, because if you're a one-man crew, you can't tell. No matter. I hope you found the tour interesting and informative, and I'll talk to you on the next one. Take care. Is it supposed to fall down like that? <laughs> Please pay no attention to the inside of the cupola lining falling down. That's not supposed to happen. Museum pieces. All right, so the bottom half of the vehicle is not really very much point in looking at it because it is, in effect, a Curacier. The only major notable difference is that they have a somewhat beefier travel lock to compensate for the... Actually, it's not. It's the same travel lock. It's the same. Almost. Yeah. It's the other way around. Yeah.